Morning everyone, I can see we're getting some participants joining so we'll just wait a couple of minutes um, just to make sure we get everybody on the call. I think you're good to go now, Alison. Yep, perfect. Um, so welcome along everybody um, on this kind of icy Tuesday morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Alison Hemsey. I'm a project manager at Scottish Enterprise. And along with my colleagues, Nicola Ewing from Highlands and Islands Enterprise and Sandra Campbell from South of Scotland Enterprise, we have partnered with um, TimeWise to um, bring you guys a webinar, um, all focused on flexible working. So TimeWise are um, leading experts in flexible working um, across the UK and um, have had lots of practical experience and examples of helping businesses in this area. Um, so today we're going to kind of look at how employers can embrace flexible working, practical ways of doing it, um, and also give a bit of a focus on hybrid working as well. Um, we'll have a Q and A session at the end of the session, um, but also you can you can enter questions into the chat function. And we'll be able to see them as we go along. Um, so thanks again for coming, and I will pass over to um, Emma Stewart, who is a co-founder of Timewise, and will be leading the session this morning. Thank you, Emma. Thanks, Alison. Um, great to be here. Thank you very much, Scottish Enterprise, for having us. It's really good to be partnering with you. Um, and we're delighted to host the session today. Uh, if this, this session is part of a programme of work that TimeWise are running in Scotland. Um, it's been supported by the Scottish Government and it is essentially to see how we can help you as organisations improve and embed your approach to flexible working um, and critically to do that in order to be able to attract and also retain hopefully great local talent in Scotland, which would enable more people to be able to um, uh, to stay in work and to um, find good quality jobs. Um, a bit about TimeWise just before we, we kick off. Uh, we are a social business. We have been around for about 17 years. We've been obsessed for flexible working for that period, so way before the pandemic hit. Uh, we are driven by a social mission to ensure that everybody gets the flexibility they need in work without compromising their careers. And to do that, we do three main things. The first is we do a lot of uh, research and awareness raising to understand the state of flexible working in the UK today and also to champion uh, the business and the social benefits of creating fair and flexible work for all. Uh, the second uh, and a lot of the content of this session will be drawn on this is we provide practical help to businesses um, across the UK and internationally who want to improve their approach to flexible and also hybrid working. Uh, we run a range of consultancy and training services and we do our own programmes uh, that are often sector focused to try and, um, and tackle some of the more complex constraints to making flexible working work. And then the third thing we do is we run our own job site. So we represent about 90,000 people, all of whom want their next job to be a good one and a flexible one. Uh, so we're very close to understanding the needs of job seekers and the candidate market as much as understanding some of the challenges about making flexible working work within organisations. Um, our clients, just to give an example, range from many of the FTSE 250 companies um, across the UK. Uh, we've worked in sectors as diverse as retail, construction, financial services, engineering, the NHS. Uh, we are currently running a national programme for NHSE. We've just recently completed another training programme um, uh, for schools across the country for the Department of Education. So, we're very much recognised as, as leaders in the field when it comes to advising firms on flexibility. Uh, and I should say we also work with lots of small firms as well who both recruit through us and, um, and who, for whom we provide guidance and training and support. 
Um, businesses come to us for all kinds of reasons, two main reasons. Uh, one is talent to attract it and to keep it <laughs> when it comes to thinking about flexibility. And the other is um, when it comes to thinking about EDI, inclusion, well-being, um, but within that also how to drive efficiencies within the way that they operate. Um, so that's a bit about us. Uh, I should also say just briefly, we do a lot of work to advise governments as well, and we work with lots of trade bodies. Um, so again, learning from, from all of those areas. In terms of the agenda today, um, uh, uh, um, as Alice mentioned, what we really want to do, I guess, is give you some reflections on, now we've been at this for 18 months, um, and many of us were doing flexible working before, how can we make sure that we embed a sustainable approach to enabling our people to work flexibly? Uh, I think it's fair to say, we know that hybrid is probably here to stay. Um, I think the pandemic, we certainly know, is not going um, away fast. So we are having to continue to adapt how we work and we're probably going to have to stay working like this and potentially will stay working like this for a very long time. So how do we make sure that the approach we're taking is sustainable? How do we make sure it's fair and inclusive? And how do we also make sure that we can use flexible working not just to retain talent, but to also attract talent, um, recognising that we are in a labour market currently um, where we have a significant skills and talent crisis and candidate shortage. So, um, so we're going to focus on effectively hybrid, how we think about making it fair and consistent. I'm going to touch on what we do um, if we're working in frontline industries and people can't work from home. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the work that we can do to adjust our recruitment processes. I'll speak for about 30, 35 minutes, and then we should have a good 20 minutes um, for Q&A. And as Alison said, please do put your comments um, or questions as I go in the chat function um, uh, so that we can, we can take them at the end. Um, so uh, a bit of context first, uh, what um, some reflections of what we've learned over the last 18 months. The first and important thing to say is let's just define what we mean by flexible working. Um, because the last 18 months, flexibility has been mainly assumed to mean remote working, working from home. But actually, when we talk at TimeWise about flexible working, we look at it through three axes. Effectively, anything that is different to the traditional nine to five in the office. The first is where, um, which is predominantly remote working, but it could mean working from another location other than uh, your office. Uh, and what we've certainly seen over this period is remote working go through the roof. So pre-pandemic, only around 5% of the population work permanently at home. Um, at its peak, we've seen around 60% of the workforce working remotely. So we had a significant shift in location-based flexibility. But we also need to take into account the other two types of flexible working that are really important. One is clustered around when people work. This is really critical when we think about people who cannot, um, because of the nature of their job, um, uh, work from home. So when is thinking about uh, the, the times that we work, particularly when we're talking about uh, shift-based rostered environments. So if you're thinking about the NHS, if you're thinking about um, uh, social care, retail, hospitality, um, this is about when people work in terms of their shifts, their start, their finish times. Um, but it could also be about when you, when you work in terms of compressed hours. And then the third type of flexibility, which is critical, and particularly if we think about this from a gender lens, is, um, is part-time working, um, or rather how much people work or how little people work. Uh, part-time is the predominant um, form of, of people working different numbers of hours, but we also have job shares, we can have job splits, um, and we can have people taking periods of unpaid leave. Um, and in the UK, we have around about uh, between a quarter and a third of the population that consistently um, work part time. Again, it's very much occupationally clustered in certain industries. Um, shockingly, we still only have around 2% of roles that are job share. So, so where is a big area? Um, part time has historically been a big area for, for thinking about flexible work. But all of these issues, or these types of flexibility matter when it comes to thinking about what your people want to need and what you're able to offer that enables you to, um, uh, to deliver the best work you can for your organisation. So that's just a bit on, on, on types of flex. Um, so what have we learned over the last 18 months? Um, there's a lot to say, but in summary, there's been some real positives, um, but there's also been some real risks to us. 
Um, in terms of what we've learned about how we can adapt the way we work, on the positive, we, um, we've had a huge opportunity, obviously, to rethink where we work. Um, we've enabled millions of people to stay and work. I mean, obviously, the furlough, has been, the furlough scheme has been um, of huge value in this context. But essentially, enabling people to work from home has enabled many people to stay and work and just about managed to juggle work and life and care and health. Um, what we've also learned critically as businesses is many of the myths um, that have proliferated around why we shouldn't really adopt flexible working, um, we believe at Time Wise have been busted. The two main myths being around trust. In the main, all the evidence shows over this last 18 months, we have largely been able to trust people to work um, in a place where we can't always see them all the time and performance. In the main, performance in most businesses has been maintained and in some respects has been improved. So flexibility can work really effectively for businesses if done well. Um, we've also learned that flexibility can actually enable particular groups of people to be able to um, get into work and stay in work. And in fact, really recently, um, uh, there's been some research undertaken by Resolution Foundation that highlights that we've got an increase particularly in younger mothers entering the workplace. Um, uh, and obviously largely because we know there have been some adaptions made, you know, it's much easier to, to, to manage work and childcare if you are able to work remotely and you have some flexibility around school runs and pickups and things like that. Um, so we have seen some shifts in a positive way. Um, but suffice to say this period is not without its risks and, and the concerns that we and many others have had around how we are adapting to ways of working um, uh, are not insignificant. Um, so um, obviously we've had significant risks around health, our own health, health of our loved ones, health, um, of many people in the population. Um, and that is an ongoing challenge where, whereby we have to maintain flexibility and certainly different forms of working to protect people's health. Um, but within um, the way we design work and specifically focusing on flexible work, there have been some, some kind of warning signs. Um, I just want to call out three, and these are some of the issues that we want to, to talk to you about how to address going forward when it comes to embedding your approach to flexibility. Firstly, on hybrid, uh, we have seen a real increase in over hours working. Um, we've seen many, many organizations, many firms, many individuals working long hours. We recognize people have had to because of the constraints we've been in. Um, but there's been a bleed, um, and you'll have heard all about this already, but in terms of boundaries, how do we make sure that if we are working from home, we look after our well-being, our health, we manage our work within the hours that we're employed to do so, and that as business owners, we look after the well-being of our people, because actually, um, if we look after them, then we, they will often perform far more effectively for us. Um, in the UK, we've had on average two hours extra a day um, uh, been recorded in certain research studies that people have been working. We're starting to go back to the way things were, um, but we just have to be really careful that we are not um, working these extreme hours consistently because we will lose good people if we, do, if we continue to do that. Secondly, um, within flexible working, there have been some real kind of areas of inequalities. Um, so we know that, um, uh, Broadly, women have had a more of a disproportionately negative impact um, from different ways of working over this period. Now, I said earlier that more younger women are moving into work, and actually there's been a, a, a spate of women moving from part-time to full-time work um, because they've been able to work remotely, and that's positive. But countering that, we've seen a lot more older women start to fall out of work, um, just um, post-furlough, but also over this period, because it has just been really, really challenging to manage work and care, and women still take on a majority of care responsibilities. Um, and we're also seeing warning signs that more women are choosing to continue to work remotely, more consistently, and that there is evidence that shows that the more, the more people work remotely, the more they are actually overlooked um, for promotion and opportunities. Um, so some of you might have heard of the term she session, um, but just to call out, uh, we need to be careful that we um, uh, don't let people who are working remotely um, um, become ignored and overlooked. Um, and also we, we are careful about how we make sure that we take a gender neutral approach to flexible working. And then the third area to call out is, um, is what, what we're seeing in terms of a, a kind of a risk around a sort of two tier response. And as business owners, 
What I mean by that is, are we being fair and consistent to all of our workers when it comes to thinking about what flexibility they need and they can have and what flexibility works for us as businesses to enable us to deliver our, our, um, the performance we need. Um, within many organisations, that two-tier happens when we have people whose roles and tasks require them to be on the front line, facing customers, facing clients, facing patients, facing people in frontline industries and frontline roles, or even it might just be a receptionist, versus those who can pick up their laptop, take their project work and work from home. So we have an issue with this. Um, and it's an issue for many of you, I, I would imagine, if you have those different tasks and functions, which we'll come to talk about. It's also a sectoral issue where we know that um, the levels of disengagement amongst um, many frontline workers are rising because they think it's unfair that they are not being given opportunities to have some flexibility. And it is possible, and we'll come on to talk about that. So some real opportunities, but some, some areas of, of concern that we need to watch out for. Um, so what can we do to tackle this? Uh, well, as employers, um, as I said, I think hybrid is here to stay. Um, so we know we need to adapt. Um, and if we're, if those of you on the call are, are working with Scottish Enterprise and advising employers, this next section is very much about why bother. <laughs> um, the really simple answer to, to why bother is because what the pandemic has shown, and it was there before, is just the level um, of need and demand for flexibility within the workforce. If you want to attract good people, if you want to keep good people in your organisations, you are going to need to have to adapt to flexible working in some shape or form. Um, uh, the, the level of demand is huge. It outstrips um, remuneration for many people in particular roles in particular industries. Um, and all the evidence, as I said before, highlights that also if we are able to give people more autonomy and control in how they work, um, then we have increased levels of job satisfaction. That is proven. That creates increased levels of engagement and that will ultimately drive performance and efficiencies. So it works for business. Flexibility is a good thing. The challenge is how to make it work. Um, but, um, but we are all doing this. We are all grappling with it. Um, so this is what I'll come on to now. So um, I'm going to start with hybrid. Now, um, TimeWise have been advising a number of firms on what um, makes good hybrid working work. So next slide, please. Um, in terms of thinking about hybrid, uh, this is a framework that we use. Um, we do a lot of training on hybrid more broadly, um, uh, and we will be providing, and we have resources for you, and there are um, a whole range of sort of um, uh, blogs and articles on our website as well. So there's a lot to say. I'm going to try and condense it um, into a short summary here. Um, but if you are doing hybrid working, which effectively means you are enabling your people to spend part of their time working from home and part of their time in the office, then there are some principles here that we would urge you to consider and advocate in your internal communications and in how you manage your people. Um, and I should say that based on all the, the work we're doing at the moment in the market, in predominantly sort of office-based environments, hybrid as in a blend seems to be the predominant area that most people are working to We've, we're seeing and obviously it will depend on how um, this new wave of omicron plays out but we are still seeing when when restrictions are lifted most people choosing the hybrid model as opposed to all in the office or all at home um, to get this right the first most important principle is um, is trust it's a really simple thing to say but we can't reinforce it enough um, organizations that make hybrid working work have leaders that trust their managers to manage people effectively in different locations and have managers that trust their employees to work with them effectively to get their work done without necessarily having been seen to be doing it. If you don't have trust in an individual, that is not a reason to not consider flexibility. That is a reason to focus on performance. Um, and this has been an issue for a very long time, which is to distinguish a performance issue you might have with an individual from, from the issue that you may have about whether to let them work flexibly or not. So trust absolutely underpins this. And then we have sort of five areas that um, um, I'll walk you through. Um, the first is around intentional co-located time. This is effectively the, the nuts and the bolts of how do we 
when do we choose to be in the office? When do we choose to be at home? How do we design that kind of um, a model? Second is around communication transparency, which is um, how you talk to your teams about the plan you have and how also you get their input um, uh, and their preferences in terms of that plan. The next two principles, inclusion and wellbeing, are around how do you um, make sure that your plan is fair as much as you can in terms of your approach for everybody, even though we recognise you won't have the same outcomes for everybody, and how do you make sure that you look after people's wellbeing in the process? And then finally, how do you make sure that you performance manage people in a hybrid world? How do you make sure that you have uh, a fair and consistent and inclusive approach to managing people based on their outcomes, not necessarily because you're seeing them doing their work. And then underpinning all of this is, um, is obviously having the right technology and equipment in place and a policy that outlines what you're planning on doing. Um, so if I just start with the first, so being intentional about co-located time basically means having a plan for mindset as organisations about when you choose to be in the office. We've never had to do this before. We just come to the office and we do our work. Um, but organisations that are grappling with, with hybrid and managing it well have managers that are working with their teams to decide, OK, we come together in the office because we need to be together. We need to be doing what we call synchronous work, which means we need to meet. We need to have creative workshops. Um, we need to be brainstorming ideas. There are, and all the evidence shows, times when it is really important to physically be together. So the top right quadrant of this is all oh, is very much about how do we make sure that um, we consciously choose when we're going to be in the office what we're going to be focusing on the office so you you might within your organization if you're a small business you might have decided actually let's just get everyone in two days a week or three days a week and have a couple of days a week at home that's fine if that's what you're planning on doing as your initial plan because we're all still working this out but what we'd urge you to do is really think about okay well when you're in the office how are we making the most of being in the office together? And that might mean having to change your meeting schedules, because if you're all going to be in on a couple of days, those are the days you should be meeting with each other. Now, obviously, we can meet remotely and we can do these kind of webinars remotely, we can do all sorts of things remotely, but choose the times you want and you need to be working together. Um, things like onboarding new staff, clearly times to be in the office when you can, because there are absolute evidence benefits of being able to have people physically together in an office. Um, but likewise, you know, think about the asynchronous work you do, the work that you do that doesn't require you to in interact with somebody else in a team. That could be um, that you're writing a report, it could be you're working on a proposal, it could be just you're doing your admin. All of those activities can be clustered in home. But we may also have people in our teams who don't necessarily have to interact with other colleagues, but they may have to interact with clients or with customers. And actually they need to do asynchronous work and be in the office at the same time. So just using this framework, um, we find often helps organizations to think about how you maybe need to restructure your days, your weeks, your meeting plans to take advantage of when you're gonna to be together and when you're not going to be together. And to really try and think about that by task, not just by um, necessarily a binary sort of two or three days at home or at work. Um, and the other thing to say on this is even the biggest firms that we're working with are still in trial mode. So, you know, we've all taken a concept of flexible working and the sort of right to request. And it's very much for a long time been wrapped around individuals and managers have had individual conversations with people. This is at scale. This is at team level. And all of this is going to require a way of working that will evolve over time. So it's absolutely fine not to have a definitive, this is how we're going to be forever. Um, and obviously you will be also thinking about your office configuration. You may decide you want to move offices. You may need to be able, you may be able to downsize, um, but you will have to try some of these solutions first in order to get it right. So that's about task. Um, uh, communicating, communicating, communicating is important, um, which is the second principle that we talked about. I don't have a slide for this, but just to say um, when you are, deciding what your plan is, please make sure that you have um, regular touch points with your teams. Um, if you're a large organization, that's about your managers consulting with their own teams and feeding back up to leadership. If you're a small organization and you decide on a plan, communicate that plan. Be really clear 
around the principles, why you're doing it, and also make sure that you don't just put it out there and then um, and leave it. This is about constant feedback loops from individuals to, to understand what's working, what's not working, and a fluid and agile way of working, which is complex and will require more management time. Um, but we are going to have to adapt to this. Um, so getting it getting it right as quickly as we can is, is going to be the way forward. Um, in terms of the third and the fourth axes, this is very much a framework we use at TimeWise um, to talk about what we call the sweet spot. So when we're thinking about how we redesign work, we need to think about tasks and location. But obviously, we're people in work and all of us as individuals have our own individual lives outside of work that will, may or may not require us to have some form of flexibility, um, predominantly because of caring, um, whether it's looking after children and looking to try and work um, around childcare as best as possible. It might be for health reasons, um, but often people also need flexibility because they choose to have flexibility because they, they don't necessarily want to spend all their times working. So we have individual needs for flexibility. And as business owners, it's challenging, but the best business owners will also try and take those needs into account with our people, as well as thinking about the task-based flexibility that we can offer. And the sweet spot is effectively where you have a culture, where you have open and honest conversations between managers and individuals that enable an organization to deliver the work it needs to do within the time frame it needs to do it in, within um, the budget it has, and to get the work done as effectively as possible with people being able to work in a way that best suits them. That sweet spot, is, is predicated on what we call fair and inclusive flexible job design. Um, and that is about being really proactive and trying to have these conversations with your teams about how they need to work and trying to look at how we then shape the work that we can do um, to suit people's individual needs. Um, just, this is something we haven't as, as organizations done before. We're all learning how to do this. Uh, and what I would say is we did some research a few years ago with the Chartered Management Institute that asked a cohort of managers how many times they had brought up the conversation about flexible working with um, someone they managed as an annual review or performance appraisal. And it was only one in five had ever actually mentioned it. So we'd urge you, you know, you talk about pay, you talk about performance, you talk about, you know, objectives, talk about flexibility now when you're talking to your teams, talk about how the way they're working enhances or prohibits them being able to do their best work. Um, and let's see if we can find some ways through that. And that um, those one-to-one -one conversations and that proactive um, leadership and management stance is what gets organizations who do this well to be really effective because uh, you avoid the non-conversation, you avoid the, the disgruntled employee, you avoid somebody saying, I want flexibility, someone else not really understanding what that actually means. Do you, do you just need, to come in an hour later in the morning or is it you really want to work from home two days a week or what is that flexibility that you need and we also need to take responsibility as individuals as well and when we communicate this to our teams to say to our people we will try and accommodate your flexibility but you also need to try and accommodate um, how this can work within your team and your colleagues as well so it's a shared conversation and it's a shared responsibility to make sure that we work fairly with this um, the final slide I want to talk to you about in terms of hybrid, and I should say we will share all of this, obviously it's being recorded. Um, there's a lot of information in these slides and we'll go through them quite quickly. So um, you'll get a chance to have a look in more depth. But the final um, principle I want to touch on is just, if you're doing all of this, how do you know it's working? Um, what are the kind of questions you should be asking yourselves as organizations, or if you're advising businesses, what are the kind of questions you can ask businesses to say, okay, if you're doing hybrid working, are you making sure you're taking a fair approach? Are you being inclusive? Um, and is it, does it feel consistent for everybody? Um, we've highlighted four questions here and some considerations underneath. I won't go through all, but I'll just call some of them out. In terms of fairness, um, one of the key things is, are you open to flexibility for everybody and offering it in terms of trying to match their needs in terms of how they need to work and the tasks they need to do? Uh, if you're not, do consider making a statement around that, but recognising that it's OK to say you can't offer the same flexibility to everybody. So you'll be open to conversation. It might mean that if you have somebody in a frontline role 
you'll enable them to have a staggered start and finish time a couple of days a week. Um, it might be you consider a job share so that they can work less, but you still have the cover um, versus being able to enable someone to work fully remotely if they're in a project role. So are you having those conversations? Are you making those statements? And are you considering it? Um, presentee privilege is effectively, are you making sure that when you allocate out work, um, uh, you are being fair to your remote workers? Are you making sure that uh, you are um, giving the same opportunities to people who are not necessarily in the office every day um, as those who are? Um, we have a real thing when it comes to affinity bias. It, we get we it, there's lots of research that shows that managers give um, uh, particular colleagues pieces of work if they're there if they're chatting. There's some really simple things we can do, which is make sure that when we do Zoom calls or hybrid calls, when the meeting stops, the meeting stops. There isn't and then an, a, a sort of follow-on conversation for the three people that happen to happen to be sitting around the table in the office, which excludes the two people who've just started out working from home. So just having some principles in place. Are we being fair? and checking in with our remote workers to say, do you feel included? Do you feel part of things? Um, making sure that your performance isn't impacted. As good organizations, we should be managing performance effectively and tightly anyway through this period, um, but making sure that you have those performance metrics in place and that you are measuring the work of your remote workers and your office-based workers in a consistent way. Um, one of the things just to call on briefly is when it comes to part-time workers, we know a lot of research has shown that if somebody goes from full time to part time, that the outputs or the performance metrics they're judged by often isn't adapted. <coughs> and, and then part time workers are often underscored when it comes to performance against their full time colleagues, not because they're underperforming, but because those performance metrics haven't been prioritized. So just more things to consider. And then finally, in terms of well being and support, making sure that hybrid working, flexible working, ways of working is on your agenda. Um, well-being is really critical, as I said, for performance. Um, we can offer people helplines, we can offer people um, uh, uh, well-being apps, but we can also offer to make sure that we're trying to ensure that people work within the hours that we've contracted them to work. And if that's not happening, that we try and find ways to address that. We allocate work, we prioritise work, um, or find a way um, that we need to adjust our business models. Um, so those are just some ways of, of thinking about how to be inclusive in terms of hybrid. So that's hybrid working. Um, it's the bulk of what we want to talk about. I'm going to touch really briefly on two other areas to consider when it comes to trying to think about um, how to embed a consistent and a fair approach. The first is what do we do about people who can't work from home? Uh, and um, we have done a lot of work on this at Timeways over the years. We've got lots of reports on our site. Um, but essentially, uh, the challenge that many organisations have is, as I said, either you have a mix of people and your concern will be that you have some disgruntled colleagues and you're feeling that there is a risk of this sort of two tier response to the pandemic happening where your office workers are able to work from home and those that have to be on the front line have had nothing changed for them. It doesn't have to be that way. Um, we can explore ways we can offer people in frontline roles and in particular, certainly sectors and industries, some form of flexibility. And what we've learned over these time-wise is that is often about time-based flexibility. It has to be, not location. And there are three axes to consider here. The first is, can we give people some form of input into when they are working? So if we are talking, let's let's talk about retail, we're talking about hospitality, we're talking about shift-based environments, we're, people, we're talking about people who are part of a team and they're rostered. And you might be on a 35 hour week contract or a 16 hour week contract and you'll be given your shifts. Um, you might be working nine to two one day, you might be working six to 10 another. Giving people input into how that roster is built um, is really, really critical and can really help people to feel like they are being consulted. Um, and if you do that as a team, it can often help to enhance the roster process. It's complex, it requires time, but the benefits outweigh the activity to, to make that work. Secondly, um, giving people stability or rather predictability on their um, schedules and their rosters. So can we try and make sure that actually we give people fixed shifts as much as possible? We have a conversation about the fact that 
Yes, you might have to work one weekend, but it's only going to be one weekend in three. Um, trying to create some level of consistent patterns amongst the team um, in a rostered and shift-based environment makes a huge difference in terms of people being able to manage life outside of work. And then the third area is advance notice, which you'll have probably seen there's been a number of other kind of campaigns around this, living hours from the Living Wage Foundation being one, but trying to help our colleagues to have some notice in advance as to how um, as to when their shifts are going to be or when they're required to work. So if we think about those three areas when it comes to time-based flex for either full-time or part-time workers in frontline environments, we can start to think about ways we can offer some, some of our colleagues um, some other form of flexibility, which fundamentally, as I said, is about autonomy and control. Um, and just to call out one example, we've done some work within social care um, and we did a project where effectively we took a small organisation, we worked with them with a team of domiciliary care workers in South East London um, over a period of 18 months. And we effectively, with the organisation, instigated a fortnightly two hour meeting where all of the workers and the roster manager and the supervisor came together and built the roster. Now, before that, it had been done with sticky tape and backhanded conversations and somebody working it all out based on long-standing staff, new starters, um, and then it all got adapted. It wasn't transparent, it wasn't clear. The two-hour meeting um, was a big chunk of their week, but what it did was it meant that carers had a say, um, sorry, care workers had some kind of say in terms of that roster, they had some input, they felt collective responsibility, and that team dynamic also meant that they were actually able to recognize that they would not always get what they wanted because they started to recognize other people's needs, whether it was caring, whether it was health issues, whether it was just, I need some time out. Um, and that enabled them to work collectively, far more effectively to build those rosters. Um, so the process of doing this can be quite complex, but there are some roadmaps in place. Um, the principles around it, as I said, are about trying to think about how you can try and create some predictability. And at the heart of this is about having managers who are able to have the time and the space to have those conversations. And we recognize that in many industries that is really hard to do, but um, we've worked with construction firms who've done this on um, construction sites on HS2, we've worked in care homes, and we've worked uh, with big retailers like Tesco. So there are models in place. And we would urge you to try and think about just even if it's starting to have those conversations about preferences, trying to sort of think about that approach if you are working with people in frontline environments. Um, so that's hybrid, that's basically how to help your employees. We have a checklist for you, which is sort of based on a kind of gold standard set of questions, but hopefully a trigger, which we'll be able to share with you after this. And as I said, there's a range of our reports. I'm just gonna end quickly, because I'm conscious we need to allow some time for questions. Um, and I guess the last, for the last couple of minutes, just to flag, um, we have a huge opportunity here to not just use flexible working, hybrid working as a way to retain good people and enable them to do their work, but also to attract candidates. We've got talent crisis at the moment. Um, uh, just as a reminder, the way the law works at the moment is employees can only ask for flexible working formally after 26 weeks. That is a huge problem when it comes to the nine out of 10 people in the UK who want to work flexibly moving jobs. So if you're a business and you want to attract people, um, one of the best things you can do is say that you're open to a conversation about flexible working as part of that recruitment process for candidates as well as for your employees so that people feel they can move and bring that flexibility that they've negotiated with them into your role. Um, in Scotland at the moment, we know that only one in four job vacancies actually says anything in the job ad about flexible working. It's based on an index we produce um, have we produced one for Scotland last year, we'll share it with you, and we're about to launch um, our new one in the spring. Um, it's the same pretty much as, as the UK average. Uh, why? Because many businesses, and many hiring managers in particular, do struggle to know what kind of flexibility could be on offer in that role. Many also believe that actually people will always ask. The truth is candidates don't. Um, we know that two in five people often will not apply for a job if they want flexibility or need it because they feel they may risk being turned down still. So 
There is a consultation at national level. The government is considering offering flexibility um, from day one and changing the law to make that a right to flexibility, a right to ask at least. Um, we would urge you to start now by making some changes to your recruitment processes because the business reasons right now are absolutely significant. You will widen your talent pool, you will widen the diverse range of people you can have in your organisations. Four things to think about. Obviously, the first is check that the organisation is comfortable with flex. That's one of the reasons hiring managers don't do this, is they're not sure what kind of flex. Read our guides, think about what kind of flex. If you're not sure, just say we're open to the conversation, because at least that will attract candidates to come to you. Make sure that your organisation is comfortable with this. If you're doing it for your existing employees, which you have been probably over the last 18 months, we assume you must be comfortable. Simply translate that into your recruitment processes. Make sure you build it in. So make sure that somebody, when they're interviewing candidates, asks the question, are you looking for some flexibility? If so, what? We, you know, we, we'd like to hear what you've got. We can't necessarily commit to accommodate it, but we want to know now before we consider hiring and communicate it in your job ad. So you get the candidates in the first place. Um, only one in four vacancies currently say this in Scotland. If you start to say it, you'll have a competitive advantage. Only one in 10 nationally reference part-time, only 3% reference any flexibility on shifts or, 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 or rosters. So, you know, we've got a long way to go to enable people out there in the market who are looking for work to believe that they can apply to jobs and, and have some flexibility from day one as opposed to have to wait 26 weeks. Um, it's a great way to attract talent and we would urge you to do so. I'm gonna stop now. <laughs> um, uh, and pause and bring colleagues back in from Scottish Enterprise. I hope that's given you some food for thought. Um, as I said, we're talking about hybrid working, we're talking about how to make it fair and consistent in frontline roles, and we're talking about how to translate that into your recruitment practices. Um, uh, we would love to hear your thoughts, anyone on the call, any comments, reflections, or any questions that you may have for um, myself or colleagues from Scottish Enterprise. Thanks, Emma. I've stopped sharing the slides now and if everyone can come back on camera. So we're joined by our colleagues, um, Alison from Scottish Enterprise, Sandra Campbell from South of Scotland Enterprise and Nicola Ewing from Highlands and Islands Enterprise. Welcome along. No questions in the chat at the moment. Um, ignore what's said on the slide. It said, please introduce yourself when you speak, but I'm afraid the settings on the webinar today won't allow for you to come to the microphone, but please do pop some questions. Um, in the Q&A box along the bottom if you have any um, and we're happy to hang on although Sandra I believe you've got something that you need to pop off for a little bit earlier than, than 11 o'clock so please do that when you're ready. While we're waiting I thought um, I'm gonna I'm gonna take take presenters privilege and Alison um, I'm interested um, from your perspective within Scottish Enterprise to, to try and understand to what extent do you think there's been a, a shift in working patterns towards hybrid from the businesses that you're advising where, where do you think they are on this journey towards doing hybrid and, and, and what are some of the sort of challenges that you're seeing oh oh you're on mute Alison I think there we are I think I have to unmute my headset and the the platform so that's the problem but yeah I think um as you kind of alluded to through the through the whole presentation lots of businesses had to do it you know there was no choice and so it was a kind of scramble to have people working from home and not just working from home also working flexibly because their children were around or they had different things going on um so I think the challenge for a lot of businesses has been the fact that um when we then, as you see, maybe move to a more hybrid model or start to move back into the office, then what's the best way of doing that in a planned way? Because before it was kind of all scramble and do it and we're, we're doing it fast and we're doing it, you know, sometimes not in the best possible way, but we just had to get it done. So it is, it's, it's looking at how I suppose you then plan it going forward. And some of the slides you were talking about there were really interesting um, around not thinking about, OK, we want people in the office these days, but we want people in the office for these activities. So how do, I suppose, um, employees handle that? Um, how do managers handle that if somebody's saying, well, actually, I don't want to be in the office that day, that's not the day, you know, so I suppose it is, it's a, it's a huge undertaking for managers and leaders, but as you say, I suppose it is that keeping those lines of communication open, but um, maybe there is the need for some sort of 
tools to to facilitate those conversations as well. Yeah, definitely, Alison. And I think that's that's why we're seeing it taking time to settle in. And I'm sure that's mm-hmm. obviously what you're seeing as well. Yeah. Um, because it is, it's about it's about manager and employee conversations, but it's also mm-hmm. doing it at team level and trying to work out what works for you as an individual. Yes. but also what works for the business. And that is complicated. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've got some tools that we'll certainly share, some kind of trigger points. But I think the, the thing we'd urge is those are the conversations that need to start happening now. They need to be factored yes. into day-to-day activity as opposed to just not happening. Because mm-hmm. the risk is people just work from home, no one will talk, talk about it, and then people will get disgruntled and then, and then things will go wrong. Yeah. So, yeah, it, I think yeah. it's, it's going to take a while. A couple of questions yeah. have come in, Emma. Oh, sorry, Alison. On you go. Sorry. Thanks. I was just going to see if there's a question in. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple here, actually. Um, first one from the Q&A is um, interested to find out how companies are planning on when employees can come in and out of the office. Have you got any examples of that so far, Emma? So, um, so when I think there was initially um, many of the firms that we spoke to needed to provide some kind of plan. So a lot of firms have gone with a three, two day split. So they've gone generally with a, let's choose a certain number of days where we'd like to come to the office. And then there's a certain number of days where you can work from home. Um, I think what uh, a lot of firms have realized is obviously that has its own challenges as we've just discussed in terms of actually not adapting the actual activity you're doing. Um, And also it can create problems when it comes to thinking about how you utilize office space because you've either got no one in the office or you've got everybody in the office. Um, And if you're a mid-sized firm, that's not effective or efficient in terms of being able to to reconfigure your offices. So we're seeing it starting to adjust and to flex a bit. Um, We're also seeing when when it comes to times of day um, changing as well. So people certainly not wanting to travel in at peak commuting times, people wanting to to sort of create a blend of, of, you know, of different sort of start and end times of the day. Um, but like I said, there are a lot of different patterns happening at the moment. Um, where it's working well is where people are documenting and reviewing and then trying to enhance that approach. Um, so there isn't one easy answer. Uh, and we do lots of these webinars. And the one thing I'd stress is everyone's looking for what's the right way to do it. And there isn't any one right way to do it. It will depend on the size of your organisation, the type of work that you do and, um, and the kind of culture that you have, what you want to kind of encourage people to have. Thank you. And from the chat, Michelle's asking, what reasons or barriers are you seeing or hearing from employers for not offering flexible working as part of their recruitment process? So, um, so most of the employers we work with do do it. So there's, there's not many reasons, but we know, um, as I said, there's been some really interesting research done, certainly by the TUC recently, that shows uh, um, the volume of people that are still turned down. Um, There are lots of reasons for saying no. Um, Some are legitimate and some we think are to do with perception. So a legitimate reason for not being able to offer flexibility, and again, this will depend on the type of flexibility, is it's not possible to enable someone to work from home consistently if you're in a frontline environment, like if you're a teacher or if you are working in domiciliary care or if you're in retail. Um, But we wouldn't expect people to make those asks. Where... um, where, where, where people often say no is wrapped around issues around what we call floodgates, which is where a manager has a team of people and they have a certain amount of people working flexibly already. And then they have somebody new coming into the team who's asking for this and they can't see how they can make that work because they've already got so many people doing this. Um, and again, we don't necessarily think that's a reason to say no. That's a reason to go back to the team. If this is a really good candidate, and to have a conversation about what might need to be adapted or accommodated within the team in order to be able to involve that person with flexibility as well. Um, Because we have to be really careful that the reasons to say no are legitimate business reasons, as opposed to because it feels complicated or because we haven't um, thought it through. And we also have to be careful. There There are legally eight business reasons for saying no, which are currently being reviewed as part of the government's consultation. Um, and in fact, I sit on the government's task force that's advising on that. Um, some of them are, are, are seriously open to challenge. It will impact the quality of work. Well, we know that's been disproven over the last year. Others, uh, it's physically not possible because it will, in, it, it will impact on business flow. I mean, that is fair. The thing is, if you're going to say no, 
It's about really having thought through why you're saying no, having consulted on that and having given the candidate the opportunity to have a conversation with you, a negotiation with you in the same way that you would on salary. Um, and if you don't have that conversation, then you might both miss out. So we, we hear lots of reasons. As I said, some are legitimate concerns, um, but we would argue there is always some form of flex um, to consider and to be able to negotiate. Thanks, Emma. A couple more questions in the chat now. First one, perhaps for our enterprise colleagues, actually. How are companies offering positions to candidates who aren't close to their office if they can't collect a laptop or if they have IT issues? I don't know if any of you have maybe had examples of that. Just thinking maybe for Highlands and Islands and South of Scotland, where you've maybe got some more remote employers or, or remote mm -hmm. candidates even. Well, so maybe I'll answer from Helen, Helen's and Helen's Enterprise. Yeah, thank Sorry, you, Nicola. Can you, can you hear, can you hear yep. me okay? Um, yeah, no, from our own organisation's perspective, um, we certainly, um, we will get um, technology and laptops and chairs and desks and things like that out to our employees in the more remote and rural areas. So that, that's not been an issue um, for us per se. And I, I believe other organisations in the Highlands and Islands have been fairly flexible in that manner as well. So... Um, and you know, and, and ad adopting other like interviews and things online as well. So um, travel hasn't been where it's been curtailed has not been a huge issue in that in that way. Good to hear it. Thanks, Nicola. No, I'll just add something as well. I mean, I, I think if you're a small organisation and um, somebody needs to work from home and they physically can't be in the office, we recognise it is a challenge. I mean, obviously, I'm aware there have been national grants available. Um, first, it's important to recognise if you're asking someone to work from home legally, you have a requirement to make sure that they are set up to do so in some way. Um, but if it's really challenging for you, then there are other ways to, to there are other options to consider. Um, uh, it may be that you might be able to find a location that they can work in um, that's nearer to their home than necessarily to the office, that may not necessarily be a permanent solution. But, um, but the, the most important thing is to have those conversations to explore what kind of um, support government funding there is available for you, and then to explore those with the individual. Again, um, a lot of this comes back, back to being really proactive and being really transparent in, in how you're trying to think this through. Thanks, Emma. And a final question from Ryan Stewart, um, probably one for you, I think, Emma. How would you recommend managing demands for office space so that we don't have all staff in, say, Tuesday to Thursday and empty offices on Monday to Friday? Do we have any examples of, of that? Uh, so do a bit of a diagnostic on the activities that you want, as we've talked about. Um, if everybody, you know, no one likes coming to the office on a Friday, nobody likes coming to the office on a Monday. But I think it's about how, as a management team, you uh, determine some of the principles you want to put in place. So if you want to avoid nobody being in on a Monday and Friday, then that's about, you may need to make some adjustments to the level of activity that you're doing on a Monday and a Friday that's task-based. So if you want to have team meetings, um, because it's, not, it's about not necessarily saying to everybody, you, you can't work from home on a Monday and a Friday because we don't think that's good for business. It's about saying you can't work at home on a Monday and Friday because we need you to be collectively together to do these activities, which we are scheduling on these days. So uh, it's not easy, but, um, but think about the tasks and the activities. If you legitimately don't have any tasks or activities or client demand, and that's a really other important one, on a Friday, and actually a Friday is a good down day for people to, to do admin, to do other activities. Maybe you don't have a reason to ask them to come into the office, but it's about thinking through why, based on the nature of the work that they're doing and the collaboration you want to see happening, you need them to be able to come into the offices on those particular days. Great, thank you, Emma. Doesn't look like there's any more um, questions in the chat at the moment, um, but our contact details are on screen. If you have any further queries, please do get in touch. We will um, be in touch with you with the resources that we mentioned um, later on today. And I'd just like to thank you all for coming along. And thanks to uh, our enterprise colleagues for hosting us today. Thank thanks you. Very thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks all. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.